right, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Connor Bowles. I'm the director of, director of Creative Partnerships at Great Big Story. Uh, I'm based in our company's London Bureau. Um, I moved there two and a half years ago. Originally was based in New York, where I helped launch the platform um, out of the CNN digital video space. Uh, I'm here to tell you a little bit about how I got to where I am today and what Great Big Story is and how we got to where we are today, uh, then what we make and how we make it. And uh, the how we make it part is really uh, here to illustrate how important it is to us in the digital video space to make sure we're advancing our narrative and telling our story with every single frame of video we use. So first of all, a little bit about me. Uh, the year was like 2002. Um, I don't know if you guys remember the US show Jackass, but uh, I weirdly credit that show with like setting the foundation for my entire career as a video maker. Uh, it put a lot of copycats in hospitals. Uh, I got a fair amount of stitches. A lot of my friends broke bones, but like I went out, I bought a camcorder, I taught myself how to edit, made my friends do stupid stuff, and eventually that led to um, I kept crashing into things. Uh, but I survived that, and uh, that evolved into a career in broadcast and journalism. Uh, started at ABC News, moved on to Reuters, helped them launch their YouTube presence, uh, then ended up at Now This News. That was really cool. Got to pioneer some stuff, got to meet DMX. Uh, and then 2014, uh, joined up with CNN and their digital video team. Uh, they were getting pretty serious about kind of putting a lot of effort and footprint behind their digital video presence. Piloted some really cool series, worked with some amazing sponsors, got to meet deep sea creatures. That's a giant isopod from 2,000 feet below the surface. Uh, and then 2015 at CNN, I was approached about this top secret project. It was called Project Bear. Uh, and I didn't really know what it was. Um, people were pretty excited about it, and uh, I decided to kind of take a leap of faith. Uh, and that top, secret, that top secret project became Great Big Story. So here we are on the morning we hit, excuse me, the evening we hit launch in New York City. Uh, we, were, we were a lot smaller then. Now we're almost approaching 100 people uh, in New York and London. And, uh, we were pretty happy, but I, I must say we didn't know like, how truly amazing we were about to be a part. We were about to be part of the coolest thing I've ever been a part of. And let me show you what that is. At Great Big Story, we believe the path to common ground is celebrating our differences. We believe in leaving a gentle footprint on the planet. We believe in the power of community and the resiliency of people. Our stories are created by global storytellers and renowned brands. And then you look around you, it's incredible. We believe that this is a world worth fighting for. So yeah, that's us. Uh, we are a multi-platform uh, network that tells videos and stories about the untold, the overlooked, the flat out amazing from around the world. Uh, you can find us on YouTube, you can find us on Facebook, you can find us on our owned and operated owned and operated sites and apps. Our goal is to be everywhere that you watch video. OK, so how did we get from Project Bear, top secret Project Bear, to where we are today? Uh, back in 2015, 
Uh, our founders at CNN kind of were looking at the internet video space and they saw it really fell into two categories. You had your light and your mindless, your, you, know, you guys all know what I'm talking about, that video that made you laugh, you shared it with your friends, maybe involved a cat or a dog. Uh, and then you had kind of your shocking and your provocative. Uh, you know, our, our, our awesome parents at CNN were handling that pretty well. News often tends to shock and provoke. Uh, maybe it's some news from a conflict zone or a particular soundbite from a politician. And we really just, there was a massive space in between that we wanted to capitalize on. Somewhere where we could kind of flex that same intellectual muscle from the shocking and the provocative, but add a little levity and positivity to the content we were, we were making that would maybe make you feel a little bit about the world, feel a little bit better about the world you were in. And, and maybe after watching the video, that spirit could carry on with you beyond just that first watch. So it's 2015, we're a team of storytellers and we're looking this massive space in the face and we kind of then had to figure out, okay, what are gonna be our governing principles and how are we gonna fill it? And one of the things that time and time again we settled on was quality. Every frame of video needs to be the highest quality in order to be continually advancing the narrative because at the end of the day, we're competing for eyeballs in every frame of video in the digital space. Um, and two of the principles that kind of guide every story we make are, show me something I've never seen, tell me something I didn't know. And so that's what we've been following. And it's been working. Uh, we've got a lot of people that watch our content. And we've told over 2,000 stories in over 100 countries. We've hit all 50 states. Uh, I'm sure by the end of this speech, these numbers will have all increased. That's kind of the beauty of real-time analytics and all of these digital platforms. It's, it's been really fun and really rewarding. So in each of these narratives that we put together, there's kind of four principles that we look at for what makes a great big story. The first one, the element of surprise. And I'm not talking about like, like horror, like ah, but like, you know, this is the show me something I've never seen. This is that wow, that factor that after you stop watching, you're like, oh, I've never seen that before. Secondly, it's gotta inspire our audience. Uh, it, we, we believe it's an amazing world that we live in and we wanna tell stories that make people feel the same way. So anything that we're covering, anything that we're telling a story about needs to inspire. It's also got to be relevant. So our producers are on the road or in the office pitching, and every story they're trying to make, it needs to fit into our world in a way that's relevant to conversations that are happening, uh, topics, topics that are coming up at the dinner table or in cyberspace. Um, our stories need to be relevant in somehow. And arguably the most important of all to me uh, is it's got to be cinematic. It's, it has to move you visually. We tell stories uh, that fit on screens like this and they're consumed a lot, but they also need to look amazing. And I can't tell you how cool it is to be seeing our work on a screen like this because normally I'm looking at it on a phone. But that core tenant of cinematic quality uh, goes into every single shot and every single frame of video we, we produce, which brings me to a particular piece I wanted to talk you through uh, that was produced out of our London office. Uh, it's from a series of microdocs we did about places around Europe that are known for long traditions of craftsmanship. So come with me now to a, a town in Spain known for its, uh, its sword making. In central Spain sits an ancient walled city that has dedicated over a thousand years to one single craft. This is Toledo. This is history's blade capital of the world. This is the city of swords. Okay, so that's just the intro and I promise stick around. I'll let you watch the whole thing. It's really awesome. But uh, I put that intro there, A, to show off just the, uh, the amount of things that are the filmmaker packed into just those first 25 seconds, and then also to kind of highlight one thing that we've learned in the digital video space is 
we're not hiding anything there. We basically, you know what this story is going to be about. And that is an important thing we've learned is you hook your audience by giving the whole thing away for free at the beginning. And if you combine that with incredible cinematic visual telling, cinematic visual storytelling, I promise you they're going to stick around and watch the whole thing. And we, we do have the analytics that prove that they stick around and watch it. So uh, let's break down a few of the things that went. So first of all, that first shot. This is how Jacob, the filmmaker, went from this to this. So this is that first shot. Uh, it was one of a dozen takes, and it was really simple. He just set up the tripod and had her swing the sword. And because we, um, you know, we aren't held to a lot of the broadcast constraints uh, in the digital space, so we've, we, this was shot at 48 uh, frames per second, and that creates that natural motion blurring. I'll play it for you again. Then uh, back home in our studio, which is actually doubles as a conference room, uh, <laughs> he filmed the globe and repeated the same motion. And this time, you can see it's in reverse. So then uh, he chucked it in Premiere and linked the, uh, that seamless transition so it felt like one perfectly seamless whip from Spain back to the globe. Here it is again in full screen. OK, and then the next shot, we've got these hyperlapses. You know, the, the purpose here is really to set the scene of the city's amazing architecture, really transport you to this ancient capital of culture in Spain. And um, you know, this could have easily been accomplished by just rocking up, putting a camera in front of a building, hitting record for 10 seconds going in front of the statue and doing the same. But as you can see here, it just creates this hypnotizing visual effect that really keeps you moving as, as the narrative goes along. And this was accomplished um, by taking single, steps, single step and a still photo for about 15 minutes. So photo, step, photo, step. Uh, and then linking it all together and smoothing it out in After Effects. Here's the statue. You notice he actually went and stepped up onto that circular platform right there at the end. Then uh, you chuck it back in, grade the color, reverse the action, smooth it all out, and you've got a pretty interesting intro that puts you right in the middle of the city. And the title card. So this is the place where you see the city in all of its glory. Uh, this took uh, quite a bit of work. Uh, mainly uh, driving across the river, setting up across the, the town, and rolling uh, time lapse. But we use uh, every single lens in our kit, from our most, our, like a 400 millimeter zoom all the way to our widest wide angle at 11. So first we filmed the zoom lens. Can't really tell except for the occasional bird, but this is a time lapse. Uh, then with our middle distance, start to see some cars moving. And here it is with the wide angle. Wow, that's the city. Oh, and again, they stayed there until the sunset and did it all over. So then they linked it all together in After Effects, and they make this one giant hyperzoom. Toledo, Spain, the city of swords. And this is all it was behind the scenes. Uh, pretty simple setup tripod, A7S, uh, and all of our lenses. Now, uh, it takes a long time to do these kinds of things. Uh, you know, here it was later in the day. And it takes uh, a short amount of time to do these things in post-production. So this was all shot in two days and then edited in the matter of a week. And when I tell people that, they usually ask why. Why do we do that? Why do we push ourselves that hard? especially when you're just throwing it out into the internet, which can be kind of a dark and nasty place, and no one really appreciates your work. Well, 
We hoped people would. And it's things like this that, that remind us why we do what we do, why we put effort into every single frame of video that we're putting together into each one of our great big stories. Now, there's, if you go on our site, there's also lots of weird internet speak that I don't understand either and, and, and plenty of memes. But in the middle of that, there are people that are just taking the time to tell some strangers they really appreciate the fact that we <laughs> went to the other side of a mountaintop and stood there until the sun set. And, and that's, that's really what makes it worth it for us. So uh, this is the team that, that made that film. Jacob there on the left, uh, he is uh, one of the most incredible filmmakers I've ever worked with. Uh, we, we call him an editing god in our office. Um, but uh, he, he, he's an incredible shooter and a producer, and he kind of visualized this whole story. And Sophia here on the right uh, ca came along on the shoot. She is an ace producer. She's an awesome shooter. And they really, really, really knocked this one out of the park. And on that tight timeline, that two days in the field, you know, there's one secret that we've learned time and time again, this, this trick that, that really pays off in dividends for us to be able to pull this all off. And it's this, the lowly, lovely paper script. Uh, the only way that we could do what we do and make these kind of amazing stories come to life in such tight timelines is we sit down and plan out what we're going to do. And it's been really, really interesting from my standpoint coming up in a kind of a journalistic background is having this opportunity at Great Big Story to marry scripted filmmaking cinematic techniques with the honest journalistic storytelling that you know, we've, we've brought from our past experience in the worlds of broadcast and digital journalism. And you'll see all those moves we talked through earlier, they're right there. Starts with the sword, follows the movement, moves to the globe, hyperlapse towards the statue of a woman holding a sword. Now, all the stuff in gray in between, you know, that's that, that's that gray area, for lack of a better word, where we, we kind of realize that anything you can plan is still open to interpretation because at the end of the day, we are filming real life. But if you create guardrails, you're able to really, really work within those and produce a much higher quality cinematic experience. And when you do that, you actually have a little bit of time to have fun on set. So uh, they produced a pretty amazing film, but they also got to get their hands dirty. And now, uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, I think it's time to finally go and experience the City of Swords. In central Spain sits an ancient walled city that has dedicated over a thousand years to one single craft. This is Toledo. This is history's blade capital of the world. This is the city of swords. Bienvenido. Bienvenido. Bienvenidos a Toledo. Me llamo Doño Ruiz. Soy presidente de la asociación Baucan. Baucan es una asociación templaria eh, y nos dedicamos al estudio del manejo de la espada medieval. Lo hacemos centrados en el siglo XII y XIII, que es el periodo en el que existió la Orden del Temple. En Toledo hay fabricación de espadas desde tiempos inmemoriales, desde los romanos, los árabes, la Edad Media, que es a partir del siglo XVI, XVII, que es cuando eh, que la calidad del acero de Toledo era superior del orbe. ¿no? Manejar una espada en las calles de Toledo, escuchar el sonido del acero, cómo rebota en esas piedras milenarias. ¿no? La magia es algo intangible, ¿no? la magia son sensaciones. Soy Mariano Zamorano, maestro espadero. Yo empecé con la fabricación de espadas cuando tenía unos 14 años. Este taller pertenecía a mi padre, era de mis abuelos. Yo actualmente soy el único maestro espadero que queda dentro de las murallas de la ciudad de Toledo. El hacer una espada luego requiere mucho tiempo. Las espadas, bastante grandes, llevan unas 30 y tantos, 40 horas de trabajo. Si la queremos decorar, va a tardar ciento y pico o doscientas en hacerla. 
hay espadas que valen 1600, 1200, 800, dependiendo de las horas de trabajo que llevan. Para la fabricación de espadas también es muy importante ser de Toledo, ya que la energía que transmite las piedras de la ciudad hace que seas artesano. Si no eres de Toledo, no haces espadas. Me llamo Fernando García Loaiza y soy grimista histórico. Soy instructor en la Asociación de Esgrima Antigua de Toledo. Intentamos eh, emular lo que sería un duelo eh, a través eh, del estudio de tratados y manuales del siglo XIII hasta el siglo XVIII, XIX. No se practicaba desde hacía cientos de años. Estamos, por supuesto, protegidos con coderas, guantes especiales, caretas, protecciones, pero eh, no hacemos nada teatralizado. Tenemos que, con nuestra, nuestros conocimientos y habilidades, ser capaces de derrotarle. Una asociación de esgrima se puede constituir en cualquier sitio, pero en la importancia y la relación que tiene este instrumento con la ciudad es muy grande. Hay mucho misticismo en Toledo alrededor de la espada y tiene cierto encanto. La verdad es que desde la primera vez que lo vi ya me enamoré. That is the City of Swords, and um, none of that would be possible uh, without the amazing products at Adobe. Uh, we also rely on them not only for our, wi our video workflows, so everything we edit is in Premiere, everything that we got to like really juice up and make cool is done in After Effects. Uh, we rely heavily on the Mogarts feature in order to make our kind of templating work across everything we do. Uh, we clean up all of our audio and audition. Um, I don't know if you were here, here earlier for the last uh, presentation, but now I'm going to try and figure out how to get a character animator into our next microdoc somehow. Um, so I just wanted to thank them for this opportunity and thank you guys for uh, sitting and, and hearing, hearing more about Great Big Story. And I wouldn't be a true digital video storyteller if I didn't say, uh, please uh, remember to like and subscribe and uh, check us out everywhere that you watch video. So thank you guys.